Welcome to the Fordham Institute and the Hoover Institution. Uh, for people just now walking in, get food and drink at the back, have a seat, and we are commenced. I'm Checker Finn. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to the third in our series of Education 2020, which is intended to look with uh, clear eyes, as in 2020 vision, to the future, as in 2020, um, of education. And uh, to get some fresh thinking on some uh, uh, long-lasting problems, uh, including two that we will be exploring in considerable depth today with the help of Naomi Schaefer Riley and Jonah Goldberg. And it is my pleasure to kick us off for the first half of this double header. Um, my Fordham friends who follow baseball say that is a sports metaphor. This is a, uh, a double header, uh, which will con consist of uh, Naomi and uh, with me and then Jonah with Mike Petrilli. Uh, I have known Naomi, I think, since she was very young, but Naomi is an adult, has become an extremely prolific uh, writer, author, commentator, columnist, um, and is now at the American Enterprise Institute. And um, she is tackling a particularly uh, challenging question, which is the question of the most challenged kids in America. Uh, kids basically without functional parents, and what is the education solution for them, if there is one, and to what extent does school choice supply that uh, solution? Uh, and without further ado, it's really an honor and as well as a pleasure to introduce Naomi. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. No, uh, uh, no we're going to switch that, <laughs> not checker. And not Jonah, so don't expect any jokes. Um, Thank you all for coming out today. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, so I want to start by telling you a story. A few years ago, my husband and I had a meeting with our son's first grade teacher. And I, you know, being the doting mother, of course, thought he was behaving like an angel in class. But my husband actually asked the teacher about his behavior. And the teacher uh, told us that he had a habit of, uh, quote, filibustering during class. That might not surprise you if you know my husband and me, but um, anyway, uh, she said she had asked him several times to cut it out, and um, uh, it had not worked. So uh, my husband looked at her and said, we'll take care of it. Uh, upon returning home, uh, uh, we told our son that we were going to take away his Legos until he started listening to his teacher. And when we checked in with her, a week later, magically, the problem had been solved. Uh, so I've been thinking about this story recently because I spend most of my time now researching the lives of kids who don't have a parent or any really functioning adult in their house uh, who are paying enough attention to take away their Legos. Um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about a school called Mott Haven Academy, which is a charter school in the Bronx. Uh, it's been around for about 10 years now. Um, and a third of the kids there uh, are from families who are receiving preventive services. A third of the kids uh, are in foster homes, uh, and another third are, are neighborhood kids. Um, the fact that they're receiving preventive services means that they are probably at risk of being removed from their parents uh, at some point soon. The principal tells me uh, that in the event a child comes from the type of family where parent support isn't going to set them up for school success, she says, quote, we have workarounds for that. The biggest successes of the education reform movement over the last few decades have been rooted in the important idea that we need to give more power to parents to choose their children's educational paths, to escape the monopoly of underperforming neighborhood public schools, and move their sons or daughters either to public charter schools or private schools with the use of vouchers or scholarship funds. But for the hundreds of thousands of children whose parents can't or won't be partners, it's time, I think, for conservatives to start thinking about those, quote, workarounds. Conservatives need to face the fact that choice, at least with these kids, has its limits. This is not to detract at all from everything that education reform has accomplished. In return for providing astonishing academic results, not to mention some of the strongest community support, inner city Catholic schools and high performing charter networks asked only that parents and caregivers act as allies. These adults, often single mothers, aunts or grandmothers, did not need to be wealthy or educated, only aware and committed. They didn't have to help their kids with homework, only ensure that children would put in a good faith effort. 
They didn't need to promise that their children would always behave well, just that if their children didn't act appropriately, they would support the school's decisions about the consequences. The results of this bargain have in many cases exceeded the expectations of reformers, especially the high-performing charter networks like Success, KIPP, and Democracy Prep. Students have surpassed their peers in wealthy suburbs. They have gone on to elite colleges, and even their completion rates have surprised critics. What has become clear is that kids from poor families with single parents living in chaotic and crime-ridden neighborhoods can do good and even superlative academic work. As David Whitman writes in his book, Sweating the Small Stuff, most of these paternalistic schools are founded on the premise that minority parents want to do the right thing, but often don't have the time or the resources to keep their children from being dragged down by an unhealthy street culture. And so the teachers and administrators at these schools manage their expectations. As Whitman explains, parents' chief role at No Excuses schools is helping steer their children through the door. Paternalistic schools are typically schools of choice, and then ensuring that their children get to school on time or do their homework. But when schools do not have partners, at least one adult in the home, willing to be responsible for getting them to school on time, for ensuring that they get a good night's sleep, and do a little homework, it is hard for no excuses schools to work. Not only would the kids from these schools be unlikely to succeed without a stable adult at home, they would be unlikely to even apply for a scholarship, a voucher, or a lottery spot. It is not uncommon to hear those who oppose the reforms of the past quarter century criticize the no excuses model, citing exactly this reason. But the fact that a school model can serve most of the population, if not all of it, is not a reason to throw it out. Let me be clear, choice is worth pursuing on a nationwide basis and with great intensity because it helps many students. I would even suggest it helps the majority of students, but we need another set of policies and practices for the worst off. There are about 437,000 kids who are in foster care right now in this country, a number that has been rising, as many of you probably know, because of the opioid crisis, or at least it's correlated with that. Um, while there are hundreds of thousands of other kids who are also at risk that is receiving preventive services, it's worth focusing on this unique population, I think, because it is large and we know a lot about it. For these kids, the future looks bleak. According to child trends, children in foster care are more likely than other children to exhibit high levels of behavioral and emotional problems. They are more likely to be suspended or expelled and to exhibit low levels of school engagement and involvement with extracurricular activities. Children in foster care are more likely to have received mental health services in the past year, to have a limiting physical learning or mental health condition, and to be in poor or fair health. We should be quick to note, of course, that all of these problems are the result, are not the result necessarily of being in foster care. Rather, they are more likely the result of the circumstances that put them in foster care to begin with. Children who are in care are not the only kids in dysfunctional home situations. There are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of others who are receiving those services uh, because they are at risk of being removed. I don't want to suggest that kids in these circumstances are not eligible to attend charter schools or Catholic schools. Many of them do and are better off for the interaction with qualified, caring teachers for longer hours each day and more days in the year. Um, leaders I've spoken to at charter schools are in regular contact with uh, the Administration for Children's Services, Department of Family and Children's Services, depending on what state you live in. Um, they are reporting trauma uh, when they see it, when they see even the slightest evidence of it, uh, and they are trying to do everything they can to keep kids who are removed from their homes actually able to stay in the same school, uh, even if they are living further away, for instance. But some of these schools are simply not equipped to handle the kinds of trauma or mitigate the kind of instability that these kids are experiencing at home. Haven Academy, for its part, offers kids some of the same lessons they would get at other charter schools. But they also spend considerable amounts of time helping kids to learn empathy. Haven is run by the New York Foundling, the oldest foster care agency in the city, uh, which helps it offer a kind of unique perspective on this situation. And the Foundling also acts as a referral agency, suggesting to families with children at risk that they could send their children there. At the beginning of each year at Haven, teachers make visits to students' home in order to better understand the environment they are coming from. Like many New York schools, Haven also has a pre-K program. 
Conservatives have rightly noted that the evidence for most pre-K programs is shaky at best. A recent study in Tennessee uh, found that students who attended the program were actually doing slightly worse academically than those who didn't by grade four. Researchers looking at this study actually speculated that there is some benefit to kids being at home longer rather than in school earlier. But there are important reasons to get the po population we are talking about, foster kids and kids who are at severe risk, into school uh, earlier rather than later. Teachers can keep a better eye on their development and report any instances of abuse or neglect immediately. Mandatory home visiting programs along the lines of nurse family partnerships, but for older kids, might also help accomplish the goal of allowing teachers and social workers to stay more vigilant. When students enter the building at Haven, there are certain physical differences that you'll notice right away. Classrooms are small, uh, but they also have kind of cozy corners where students who are having difficulty can go to calm down or be alone for a few minutes. At any time of day, there are also extra empty rooms, very small ones, where children who are having larger problems can go uh, with an adult to figure out how to control their behavior. The school has very specific safety plans for when a student is out of control, including getting other children out of the way. But all of this is a last resort. The school tries many other things to prevent these incidents from happening. Kindergartners receive teddy bears at the beginning of the year that they can learn to dress and care for. They also use the RULER program, an acronym for the five skills of, that stands for the five skills of emotional intelligence. Um, when they enter a classroom, students are asked to actually rate their own emotional state, both their level of energy and pleasantness on a graph, and they're taught how to be conscious of and shift them to a state that will be more appropriate for learning. The school's efforts to maintain a calm atmosphere extend beyond encouraging self-regulation, though. Instead of a buzzer between classes, two minutes of Bach are played through the school speakers. I have to say, I wish every school would do this. It was so lovely. Um, the school also has its own counseling staff and is regularly in touch with both biological and foster parents, as well as a child's caseworker. The bureaucracy of child welfare agencies often makes it very difficult for schools to even find out what is really going on at home. Schools may make reports of maltreatment, but they won't find out what happened or whether anyone followed up. But these schools do find workarounds. This is also true in the area of school discipline. The debate over school suspension has a special impact on this population of kids. What happens when sending a child home is likely to result in no supervision for those days or worse? More important, perhaps many of the kids at Haven have no idea what it means to even have logical consequences for their actions, and there is little expectation that adults in their lives can be trusted at all. As Haven's principal tells me, it's not about, well, we're going to call your parent and you'll be disciplined at home. If it happened at school, it has to be consequenced at school. If you misbehave at recess, you lose recess. If you misbehave on a field trip, you won't go on the next field trip. If you destroy property, you'll have to work to repair it. Particularly for children at young ages, she says, we want to help kids start becoming more informed agents. When they break a rule, they know what's going to happen to them. This is often very different from what is going on in their home environment. Critics on the left and right will often say that schools cannot make up for all the deficits that lower income children experience in their homes, that schools cannot become their de facto families. Many schools, most often parochial schools, I think rightly push back against this. For the kids in foster care, whether they are living in group homes with relatives or non-relatives, or for only a few weeks with those people before moving on to the next place, some schools are trying to recreate what a stable family life would look like. At Haven, lunch is served family style with a teacher at each table participating in conversations and encouraging each other to pass the potatoes. Monument Academy, and uh, its leader is here in our room with us. I encourage you to come find her afterwards because it's an amazing place. Is a charter school with a five-day boarding program where several kids live with house parents at the school, eat their meals together, help with chores, and learn to get along in a family setting. In Florida, child welfare officials often refer kids to Seed Miami to ensure that kids in foster care or who are receiving preventive services can get first priority there for admission slots. 
Monument has also partnered, I think, with Georgetown University to provide some medical and dental care to children at school. Again, it would be very easy for your typical school to tell a parent that their child seems distracted in school because of a toothache or because their breathing seems labored when they are running around the playground. But if there is no one at home to follow up, some schools may simply have to take on these responsibilities for themselves. Leaders of no excuses schools have found themselves in the uncomfortable position of having to defend the concept of paternalism, a word they do not like to use. But at least these school leaders could always fall back on the idea that they are simply doing for these kids what their parents want but cannot accomplish. David Whitman contrasts modern no excuses schools with, say, the Indian boarding schools of the 19th century, which were involuntary, though frankly many Indian parents actually did want their kids to go to these schools. But for the hundreds of thousands of kids with no stable adult presence in their lives, we are going to need involuntary solutions, or we are going to have to exercise even more paternalism in pushing these kids into environments and ensuring that teachers and administrators take on the role of family as much as possible. As conservatives, our first impulse is to remove responsibility for such matters from schools. As James Q. Wilson wrote, paternalism seems to have democracy as its enemy and bureaucracy as its friend. Indeed, too often school administrators have abused these powers to contradict parents' teachings about family matters in the name of sex education, for instance, or to belittle families' religious beliefs. For children without a consistent adult presence in the home or who have experienced severe trauma in their home, school may be as close as they are going to get to a family, and conservatives need to find a way to live with that. When it comes to functioning adults, or even partially functioning ones, we can let democracy work. But when it comes to children, we are stuck with bureaucracy. The question, though, is how to ensure that these involuntary forms of paternalism do not turn into Dickensian institutions, and that they are run in such a way as to give these children the advantages they need, instead of warehousing them to keep their disadvantages out of public view. We should encourage some no-excuse model and parochial schools to expand their capabilities, whether that means providing more counseling for students or showing them how to live in a family, or help them with medical care, or provide them with a place to live. Parochial schools, I think, because of their missions, may be best equipped to handle this kind of education, but charter schools can also accomplish a lot. Less conservatives worry that all this talk about trauma-informed care and social-emotional learning is code for lower academic standards. The leadership, I think, at Haven and Monument know that the schools have an important academic mission as well. Many of the kids come to these schools already behind in their classes. They have missed significant amounts of school because of being transferred among schools and both because of their moves to different homes as well as behavioral problems. And even children who are capable of doing work have so often been placed in special education classes because of their behavioral questions that they can't get the education they deserve. There is no single public policy answer to helping at-risk kids succeed in school, but part of it is certainly choice. Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina all have voucher programs for kids in foster care to attend private schools. I think those programs should be expanded to other states as well. Oklahoma recently did so. The federal government also helps children who were in foster care uh, to actually to be able to afford college. Uh, the Chafee Grant finances vouchers of up to $5,000 per year for former foster care children administered, for former foster care children, and those scholarships are administered by the states. Maybe you're wondering whether a college scholarship is really going to move the needle, but I want to tell you a quick story. Uh, a middle-class mother uh, I was talking to recently in Brooklyn told me that her only son actually had just graduated from high school and gone to college and had moved out of the house, and she was actually thinking about foster care. Um, but she, she had a little extra room in her apartment, and she actually asked me how she would afford college for another child. Ensuring that states put money into an educational account that follows the child rather than depending on foster families to foot these costs is a vital part of caring for these young people. Doing so will make fostering and adopting out of foster care actually seem more feasible for many middle class parents who wouldn't want to give their children, these children, any less than they would give their biological children. Not every one of these children will go to college. Last year, America Works signed a contract with New York City's Human Resources Administration to aid hundreds of former foster youths in Brooklyn and the Bronx. The four decade old organization believes that the first step to getting people to be independent, productive citizens is getting them a job. 
There is a temptation for conservatives to avoid talking about the educational options for the most at-risk kids. Because we believe that parents are the best arbiters of decisions about their children's education, we have not fully engaged with the question of what to do with kids who do not have an adult presence in the home. The concern about getting public schools too involved in the personal and family lives of students has also made us wary about the institutions that serve these kids in a more complete way. And finally, our worries that a focus on the social-emotional aspect of kids' lives will detract from giving them the academic tools they need to succeed has kept many of us from fully engaging with the questions of how schools can heal the wounds that these vulnerable kids have suffered. Fortunately, there's no time like the present. Thank you very much. Really well done, Naomi. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, and. Uh, um, you also, incidentally, kept within our suggested time limit admirably, okay. <laughs> and so we appreciate, we appreciate that as well. Uh, let me just mention that the uh, David Whitman book, Sweating the Small Stuff, that Naomi referenced a couple times is a Fordham publication that uh, is still available for anybody that wants to uh, track it down. It was a close look at the uh, so-called paternalism issue in mostly no excuses charter schools and other schools. Uh, and I, I, so well, still well worth a look. Um, so I've got a lot of questions. I suspect people here do, too. Let me note that the avoidance of tough issues that you alluded to at the end is exactly what this 2020 project is all about. We're trying to get people to think about things they haven't been necessarily thinking about or wanting to think about uh, in recent years. So this is, uh, I'm really glad, you, really glad you said that, too. Um, <clears throat> once we, you told me earlier, before today, that once we, Fordham, started uh, I'm characterizing your paper as a choice isn't a silver bullet paper, you started getting the equivalent of hate mail from people <laughs> who think that choice is a silver bullet uh, for all kids. Um, <clears throat> can you tell whether any of the folks that are sending you hate mail think that uh, choice really works for the kids you're talking about? Did they have anything at all persuasive to say to you on that point? No, I mean, I, I think uh, they didn't, and, you know, this is the problem with advertising things on Twitter, people just read the headlines. And, I uh, never and tweet. Like, That's all Mike. And that, okay, well, I'll blame Mike then. <laughs> um, but I think that we have to, you know, be very accurate about the population we're describing because I think the people's first assumption is when I say, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the most vulnerable kids, they just assume I'm talking about poor kids. Mm. And I'm not. I mean, this is not just an economics issue. There are poor kids in this, in this country, millions of them, who have stable, responsible adult presences in their lives. And so I'm not generalizing about them. And for them, I think that you know choice probably is as close as we're going to get to a silver bullet. Um, so I think part of it is just was just a misunderstanding of the group that I was talking about. And part of it is just, uh, you know, uh, I, I've certainly been outspoken for the last, I don't know, couple of decades about my support of choice, and I suspect that people, you know, thought, oh, traitor. I, yes, that I had gone soft, but I assure you I've not. Thank you. I'm glad you haven't. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> I'm also uh, I'm glad that you're thinking about this, uh, this other population, the smaller population of, of, of uh, kids we haven't been thinking much about. So you, you I under, legitimately and properly praise the no excuses model, charter schools, Catholic schools, and so forth, uh, for its kind of tough love approach to uh, uh, education and its high standards and focus on academics and things like that. But then in talking about the population you're concerned about, you also introduce uh, what a lot of people call so the soft skills, the social emotional stuff, the teddy bears, the quiet corners, um, and uh, things that to uh, some hard line, no excuses people sound squishy and kind of emotional rather than uh, rigorous and, uh, uh, and, and, and tough. Can't, but the schools you described seem to be reconciling these two tendencies. They manage to be both... Uh, sort of rigorous academically, but also uh, soft when it comes to the emotional stuff. Can these things be reconciled? I think it's a, it's a struggle, and the, the leaders of schools who cater to this population will tell you that it's a struggle. And they often find themselves going too far in one direction, and then the next year trying to correct, mm. um, you know, based on test scores or just based on their sense of what the school environment is like. Um, it is a really difficult balance because I think these kids cannot succeed without, I mean, and, and we, social emotional skills is something, and it's, it's just talked about so broadly, and there's not enough 
um, really academically rigorous research mm -hmm. that's been done on it mm -hmm. that I hesitate to say it's kind of a cure-all. But we do need to find a way to get these kids to function in some way. I mean, if you're not used to living in a functional family and you don't have any idea how to sit, you know, civilly with somebody at lunch and ask them to politely pass the potatoes, frankly, that is going. No, I'm, I mean, yes. I'm, it's a joke, yes. but it's not no, a joke. But real. you're not. You're That's not. Real. Th that is not going to help you, even if we can figure out a way to make you college or career ready. I mean, so th trying to figure out a way, these are, these are some very basic social and emotional skills that a lot of these kids are lacking. And so I'm not sure what the exact proper program is for getting them to be able to do that. I do suspect mm -hmm. that certainly leaving aside all of these, uh, you know, uh, you know, different programs that people are trying, just the basic act of being able to sit at a lunch table or at a dinner table or live, uh, you know, in a home with other kids and other adults uh, and understand chores and responsibilities and consequences. If some way we can get them to be able to do that, I think would be, a, a, you know, certainly the, the right path down this road, even if these other more experimental, like, will giving them teddy bears teaching them, teach them empathy questions are still up in the air. So... Learning algebra doesn't isn't enough if you can't also pass the potatoes. So to That's speak. right. Yes. Uh, okay, but it's a, but it's a balancing act. It's a it's a uh, there's a tension there and a a balancing act and and educators most in my experience tend to sort of be on one side or the other of this view. Uh, you found some who obviously are trying to straddle it, trying to do both. Yeah, I, I think that they, they certainly recognize that success for these kids will involve both of these things. Um, but, you know, the problem with any school is always, you know, there are a limited number of hours in the day. Obviously, yeah. schools with longer school days are going to have more options. Boarding schools are going to have more options for this sort of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, how many hours do we want to devote to this? You know, some, I think some people will try to sort of bridge this divide by saying, well, part of it has to do with the way we teach students. And if we could teach students algebra by also showing them mm -hmm. how they should respect each other, you know, mm -hmm. that, that would be great, too. But I think some of these softer skills are just, for this population of kids, again, I'm not talking about whether we should teach typical middle class kids who are having anxiety about their phones or whatever more social emotional skills during the day. I'm really talking about a population of kids that is not getting that at not home. Not getting it at home, okay. Let's pause on the boarding school issue because uh, uh, you cited one that I don't know about. I know about the seed schools, of which I think there are t two or three now. Um, there, other than sort of strange outlying situations like the Milton S. Hershey School, there are a very tiny number of boarding schools for uh, severely disadvantaged kids that, that provide this five day a week or seven day a week. Um, and I, I, I admire them to the extent that I know about them. Uh, they're very expensive is one consideration, but is it a scalable, is it a scalable thing? Uh, or are we just going to continue to have these occasional, very rare specimens in a few places? So uh, a couple of things. I mean, uh, anyone who talks about this population always has to sort of look at the, the costs at the other end. If you don't help these kids, I mean, it sounds like cliche, but if you don't help these kids now, the cost to society of these kids when they're 18 and over is, is astronomical. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're counting the amount of money we spend on prisons or mental health services or drug rehabilitation, all of these things are things that are going to cost society either at the beginning or the end. Um, but I think even more importantly than that, this doesn't have to be a scalable model in the same way that we talk about scalable models there for poor many kids. Because there, I mean, you know, we are talking about it's a it's a lot of kids, but when you break it down by state, I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. And the state is already mm -hmm. giving a lot of money to this population in the form of you know IEPs or uh, you know yeah. in the form of special education. So yeah. I think some of the money is already there. Um, the other thing that I think was really interesting about um, talking to some of the leaders of these boarding schools, um, Monument, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, is that the five-day-a-week program in particular mm -hmm. often allows the adults who are in their lives, mm -hmm. who are relatively stable, to sort of remain in the picture, which mm -hmm. is to say, if you have, like, great aunt so-and-so, mm -hmm. you know, who's, you know, kind of a little bit elderly, but she really can do cares. It on the weekend. Right, but yeah. really cares about this 14-year-old boy yeah. who's in her life. Um, you know, she can take responsibility for him as mm -hmm. long as she doesn't have to be going to school every other day to talk to the principal mm -hmm. about his behavior and try to find him a new school when he gets kicked out. Mm -hmm. So it makes 
the mm -hmm. presence of these other adults, I think, more manageable. Good point, because in, in effect, at least in the seed model, I don't know, Monument, they, they come home on the weekend, so it's sort of two days a week instead of seven that the yes. adults are, are, are directly responsible mm -hmm. for them. Um, I was trying to do some quick numbers while you were talking. I mean, there are roughly 55 million school kids in America today. Uh, it sounded like the numbers you were using add up to about a million. What would be your guesstimate for the size of the population that you're talking about? Um, I, I think, you know, in probably a couple of million, between one and two million, let's say, okay. of kids who are going in and out of that at risk. Um, so three or four percent of the, of the school age population is what that comes out to, mm -hmm. I believe. If I'm doing my math right, um, which is a manageable, I mean, considering there's 13% of the kids in special ed uh, out of that population and something like 10% in private schools and something like 6%, I think, in charter schools. So we're talking about a relatively small number, as you said. So it maybe is affordable to think about doing some extra, uh, <clears throat> some extra. Right. Okay. What they call wraparound. Wraparound. Yes. yes. For a population that's a little hard to define, isn't it? Uh, the it's it, it'd be hard to define eligibility for these additional yeah. services, wouldn't it be? That's true. Right. You couldn't give like a competence test to adults uh, of school children and see if they pass or not. Um, yeah. But I do think, I mean, the state already identifies these kids in other ways. In other ways. I just think that they do. I mean, most of the child welfare bureaucracies. Uh, I don't think are doing a great job of handling these kids' needs. They often talk about how overstretched they are. I don't necessarily think they even have the right policies or capabilities to deal with some of these things. I mean, mm -hmm. if you, you're just, you know, the, depending on a child welfare caseworker to, you know, uh, manage dental appointments and mental health counseling and all of these things, I, I think the school, at least, is in one place. They're dealing mm -hmm. with the kid day in and day out, mm -hmm. trying to work because what the child welfare bureaucracy is doing is all of these things are being worked through the unstable adults mm -hmm. so you have to mm. get a hold of mom on mm. the phone and say you know we have a report that your child's mm. you know teeth need fixing we have a report that your child's breathing is having you know could you make a doctor's appointment here's the name of a doctor and then you have some child welfare bureaucrat who's then trying to follow i think that's that that is a task where mm -hmm. you're um, you're, you're putting the, the irresponsible adult between that child and mm -hmm. getting the care that they need. Okay, got it. So let's talk about, let's talk about um, irresponsible adults in the context of your uh, suggestion that schools can to some extent uh, uh, replicate what families do for these children or should do for these children. I can hear two conservative objections to the school as family idea. Only two? <laughs> well, two obvious ones. The first and simplest is that, of course, schools can't possibly do what families do because they're just not up to it. They don't have the kids enough. They don't have the competence. Um, they don't have the, the, the love. They don't have a bunch of things. Uh, the harder challenge is the conservative concern that the more uh, institutions try to substitute for families, the more we will weaken families, that this will actually have a long-term deleterious effect on families uh, rather than help, in addition to perhaps helping kids that need them in the short run, we will create greater dependency on institutions in the long run and uh, be damaging to families in the long run when we make it in effect easier for semi-competent parents to slough off their responsibilities that they should shoulder onto institutions that serve their kids instead. That's a hard one to, to rebut, I think. What, 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 how do you think about it? I, well, I think the, obviously the best cases of uh, schools doing this are religious schools. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think we have any evidence that uh, when religious schools come in and try to help families or help provide them with whatever it is they need, whether it's you know help putting food on the table or counseling or babysitting or whatever, that this has sent a message to the rest of the community that don't worry about it, we'll take care of your kids no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, the the public situation is a different one. You know, I will say that you know even at the no excuses charter schools, I mean, I I hear stories of. You know, a, a child lands in a hospital, and it's the whole fourth grade class and the teacher that decides to go visit them. And that child, there's nobody, there's no adult visiting that child in the hospital. Mm -hmm. In and the schools that are really trying to at least 
they, they can't replace the family. I, I acknowledge that. Um, but they are going to be the most stable presence. And you know, some states don't even have, uh, I, I think most states now allow uh, kids who have been removed from their family or have had to go to a different foster family to remain in the same school. Mm -hmm. But that's actually a fairly recent development. A mm -hmm. lot of times, if you were pulled out of mm -hmm. X school, you had to just go to school in the new neighborhood of the new foster family. Mm -hmm. So at least to create some kind of some stability. stability. Um, and, and so these teachers, you know, if, if you find, you know, a, a, a caring teacher, a school that genuinely is concerned about the home life of these kids, mm -hmm. um, you know, they can provide some of that. No, I don't think that they can, um, you know, replace the whole thing. But, uh, you know, the, the incentive structure is a problem, and that's why, Obviously, I prefer charter schools because there's a little bit more of a removal from the bureaucracy, and I prefer religious schools because there's a much greater removal from the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that will you know, sort of cut down on the disincentives you're talking about. Okay. I've got about two more questions, and then we're going to open this up. So all of you, please be thinking about what you want to ask Naomi in our remaining time with her. Um, this is Washington, so I got to ask: Is there a, any federal role here? You alluded briefly to um, some uh, federal program or policy. Uh, is there something the federal government has anything to do with or to say about? I know there's a federal law for homeless children in schools, uh, but I'm not aware. And I know there's federal programs bearing on foster care, uh, but I don't know whether whether the nexus of issues that you're talking about has a federal element to it um it's it's very hard to say i mean the the foster care issue generally is a state issue um there's some federal funding that comes in through title 4e we mm -hmm. just had a big uh fight slash compromise in, con in congress where we passed the families first legislation which uh offers states money toward preventive services for kids who are at risk mm -hmm. um you know, it's it's possible that those kind of funds could be used in this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 just it's a very tiny um, piece of the pie, and I think uh, this is going to be an area which conservatives will like to hear whether there's, there's going to have to be some, um, I think, state experimentation with this. It would be nice to see if there was a federal incentive to do more of that experimentation. This is more your department than mine. <laughs> um, but I think that, uh, generally speaking, with these kids, the, the, the more local uh, you know, efforts you can get, the better. I don't, I don't think this is a, a, a federal government problem to solve at this point. OK. So you made me think, uh, while you were talking of two children's, famous children's books, both of which start with M. You probably acquainted with them both. Do you remember Madeline, the yes. uh, girl in France, yep. uh, two straight lines? And uh, I believe she ended up in the hospital. And as I recall, the nun brought all the other kids to visit her in the hospital, mm -hmm. didn't they? Yes, they did. Remembering yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah the, well, the, um, they were war orphans, or their parents were. The, they were. The father that's were right. all in at, at, at war. At war. Yes. And so these little girls lived in a dormitory mm -hmm. uh, in a Catholic school, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Twelve little girls in two straight lines. I think that's, that's the, okay. That's correct. The other, your reference to Dickensian institutions. Have you, do you know Matilda, the old doll book do, and the yes, play and yes. I think movie that came out of it? Yes, yes. Uh, talk about a Dickensian institution. Yes. Uh, this is not what you're recommending. No, no, <laughs> this is not what I'm recommending. And, and I don't, you know, I, I think obviously there are a lot of reasons, that, and the Indian boarding schools I mentioned is one of them, that we have this. Um, kind of aversion, aver aversion yes. to to the idea of uh, of boarding schools in this way. I mean, not of course elite boarding schools, although mm -hmm. those have their own problems. But but I think that you know this any solution that involves this will have to get over some of that problem. And maybe the five day boarding program is a way to say you know we're not just sending these kids off. There is going to be some accountability. There are going to be people in their lives who know whether or not this is working. Um, I think that that could be one uh, one answer to the to the aversion to boarding schools. Yeah, the Indian experience, the the Australian equivalent with the Aboriginal schools, these situations mm -hmm. where the essentially the government decided to take their culture away from them yeah. uh, and uh, and nationalize them in some way. Uh, it has left bad taste in a lot of in, in a lot of mouths and, yeah. and bad memories, and this, of course, will run into the issue of uh, uh, the same kinds of issues of pluralism that already affect adoption laws. Uh, can uh, you know a kid be cared for by a person of another color, for example? 
or a teacher of another color, for example, in their school. Yeah. We will continue to have to struggle with those issues. Uh, all right, I am, I am uh, out for the time being. You, it is your turn. Uh, who in the uh, group gathered here would like to uh, ask uh, Naomi a question? And there's a microphone coming to you. And since we are being recorded for future viewing, uh, identify yourself, please. Um, my name is Sheikh Kitiri. I'm a graduate student at SAIS. Uh, my question is for you about the role of the civil society for these kids who don't have a stable home and how can, and I'm a conservative, this is boiling my own blood to say this, but how can we use government incentives to encourage members of community and intermediary institutions and people within them to uh, play that role uh, for these kids, if at all? Yeah. Um well, I think civil society has clearly failed these kids. I mean, they, we, didn't, we didn't really have a foster care system, you know, 60 years ago because generally they would be, these, these are kids who would be taken in by the extended family or neighbors or something if there was really nobody available for them. Um, so, you know, these are, uh, these are kids uh, whose parents really don't have a social network. They don't have, um, uh, you know, religious community or a neighborhood that is concerned about these kids. And so I'm not sure you know, that we can recreate that. Um, obviously, you know, what a lot of these kids need are foster and adoptive families. And that's, uh, you know, a separate question that, that I'm writing about as well. Um, and for those people, I don't think, frankly, that financial incentives are, are the question. Um, I mean, I would, uh, it, it's funny, I was recently asked uh, by an editor about this. I wrote a piece uh, that had to do with uh, foster and adoptive agencies or the faith-based institutions in Arkansas that were handling this problem. And the editor uh, wrote back saying, uh, well, you know, um, uh, shouldn't government be doing all of this? Um, I will, I'll, I'll let you figure out what the publication was. And, and I wrote back and I said, well, government sort of has two uh, uh, tools at its disposal. Um, it can either sort of force people to do things by law, and I don't think we want to sort of go knocking on people's doors saying you must take in a foster child, um, or it can dangle money in front of people. And I think that, frankly, we don't want to be in a situation where people who are uh, otherwise not going to take uh, orphans into their homes suddenly decide to do so because you've offered them a few hundred dollars. And I think that is actually, in some cases, the situation that we're facing now. So I don't think that this is a, um, you'll be surprised to know, a problem that government can solve, at least on that end. Uh, Carl Polzer, uh, very interesting ideas. Um, just wanted to challenge the idea that just because agents of God are involved, these are automatically going to be a safe place for kids. Just look what's happening with the Catholic Church trying to clean up its own house. I mean, if they can't keep their hands off the kids in the church, what about when they're at the boarding school? So I worked a lot with, uh, in an industry with vulnerable adults, assisted living in nursing homes. And what we end up with is a supervisor. You need a, a regulatory system, some kind of ombudsman or, or you know, if you're going to have these kids put in these outside institutions, there, any, there should, that, that's another problem that the conservatives might have, is what kind of regulation would you need to ensure their safety? Good question. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think this is a this is definitely the problem that you see in in, in institutions with uh, adults who have challenges and and uh, any kind of boarding school institution. It's why I, I I do like the five day model because I think it provides some amount of accountability um, for what's going on at these uh, at these schools and other kinds of institutions. But it's a really hard problem to solve. I mean, I think you could you create a regulatory body tomorrow and. Um, who knows whether they would be able to spot these problems or whether they would also sort of fall into the kind of, um, I don't want to call it corruption, but just kind of laziness that, you know, that goes along with this, any kind of uh, government regulatory body. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't think that just because an institution is religious that it will necessarily be the best place for a child. But I do think that um, a lot of the schools that I've looked at anyway, of course, you know, have long, hist have long histories of helping very vulnerable children. And I think that they have, uh, you know, adopted more of this model of we are going to partner with families and we're going to sort of be a child's extended family. Um, and they feel much more freedom to be able to do that um, and, and maybe more of a desire to do that than, uh, than a typical public school might. Sort of parenthetically, the, all the concern, understandable, legitimate concern about the Catholic Church and kids who've been um, abused, I, I haven't recall, I'm not recalling a single example of that emerging from a parochial school setting, but rather from the church Well, you settings. had the, the, well, the, 
the, the Indian boarding <coughs> schools, for instance, in Canada were run by religious that's institutions. True. So okay. I don't think it's a, that, that's really the... Um, and those were boarding thing. schools. Yes. 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 As a, and most yes. parochial schools, of course, as yeah. we know them are not. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're day schools. Yes. Okay. Who else? There was a hand up over here. Kevin. Oh, all right. We'll get to you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, James Speller, I, uh, in the 80s, I, for a couple of years, went to a boarding school, which was almost exclusively, but not me, um, for kids in uh, state care, uh, full-time state care. And one of the things which uh, they felt was super important was we did a lot of manual work. We did farm labor. Um, I don't know if that uh, is is a big thing in, in the schools that you're talking about, or um, the, the idea was that kids who had a lot of emotional uh, challenges would find it easier to live if they if they did that. But I, I feel like that that farm labor for for kids feels less uh, progressive than other solutions. Did you do your share? Can you grow things? Uh, I, when I was uh, a nine-year-old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when pressed. Um, I, I, that's an interesting model. I have not seen that model, but I mean, certainly uh, you could see uh, a more career or vocational uh, school that would be great for these kids. I think um, you know there is a lot to be said for uh, you know being able to work with your hands and kind of the the emotional benefits that come with that. In addition to which, I think some of the schools have really tried to focus on um, getting kids outdoors more. Um, you know, kids who are who are have a real hard time like sitting still, being able to you know be in small spaces. Uh, you know, who have emotional problems kind of related to that. Making sure that they get more time outside uh, to run around. I mean, maybe you would say this about all kids, but um, but I think that the the leaders of some of the schools I've talked to have really emphasized the just the importance of being outside um, to helping with that. So maybe that would fit in. Yes, I am <clears throat> Kevin Mankin, uh, and I'm struck by some of the similarities between the kind of benevolent paternalism that you've described today and the some of the favored, perhaps the favored uh, education policy of the reform left, which is uh, sometimes called community schools. Uh, which offer supplementary services, use the term wraparound services. In fact, only yesterday I was at an AFT event where uh, the, the offering of, of these kinds of services, uh, mental health, counseling, um, uh, medical care, uh, uh, were propounded by none other than Randy Weingarten. Um, and her other uh, proposed solution was a lot of SEL. Um, social emotional learning. Social emotional learning and, 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 and psychosocial uh, skills. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can foresee a uh, kind of meeting of the minds uh, in this respect around, around these kinds of uh, solutions. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, the first big difference is what I was saying to Jagger, which is that um, I, a lot of the wraparound services are designed to go through the parents. Um, you know, we, we could offer you this for your child. Um, we could offer you these mental health counseling services. They're doing that for the adults, too. Um, and I think that uh, some of that is getting lost on its way to the kids. Um, and uh, unless those adults are essentially a stable presence in their lives. Like, but if you talked about the adults that I'm talking about in these situations, they cannot be depended on to actually even do the small amount of follow through that we're talking about with these wraparound services. And they're, they're not going to do them for themselves, and they're not going to do them for their kids in a lot of cases. And so that, that to me, is one, uh, one big difference. I don't I don't know what the um, you know what the AFT was proposing, but in terms of the the community schools that are do doing some of these wraparound services, I think a lot of that is going through the parents um, and depending on them to to follow through. Um, in terms of the social emotional learning stuff, like like I said, um, I I think that a lot of the evidence is still out on the programs, on the ruler, on the teddy bears, on this other stuff, um, and so I I don't know I doubt frankly, that Randy Weingar is proposing that teachers sit with students at lunch and pass have... Pass the mashed potatoes? And pass the mashed potatoes. And ha I mean, because this is going to require, frankly, at these schools, th the teachers don't take, like, in a, you know, the, the, the lunch is not a break. Lunch is, we are going to sit down and have this conversation. This is part of our learning. Um, and it's interesting, because if you go back, of course, to... Uh, you know, what elite kids used to get at, you know, uh, at, at schools, at boarding schools, whatever. It was a teacher sitting down and we're all going to have like our proper silverware and we're going to learn. But now it's a much more basic version of that etiquette. But this is going to involve 
a whole lot more time and effort on the part of teachers to be able to do this for longer hours. I mean, these are, you know, this is the, the no excuses charter school model, too. This is the, we're, these kids are going to be here until 5 or 6, these teachers are going to be here until 5 or 6 in the evening. This is, this is an exhausting job, and it's really, you know, about fully engaging with this table of you know seven or eight kids, and I cannot be on my phone or thinking about my lesson plan while I'm doing it. This is my job. I have a granddaughter in a traditional boarding school, and I think it's all cafeteria style now. I'm not aware it that is, teachers yeah. ever sit down with the mashed yes, potatoes. But, Though I think you can sit down with them if you bump into them in the cafeteria. <laughs> uh, I think for. they're open to that. We have time for one, maybe two more questions before we take a very short break uh, be in between our two uh, baseball games. Yes. Um, hi, sorry, right back here. But um, first of all, thank you very much. Who are I think, you? Oh, uh, sorry, Emily Bloomfield, I'm Monument Academy CEO. Ah. So, um, and anybody's welcome to visit. But I would certainly underscore what you say. And I think, you know, uh, my question is really about whether you're seeing a growing interest as you've traveled around in looking at models, different models that really address the needs of these children. Because I would say um, to your kind of the question from a conservative perspective about. Um, sort of family dependency and taking this on. I think um, these are always second best solutions, but the family is typically um, often incapacitated or the source of harm for children. And so it's really trying to uh, uh, create that buffer that a, that a typical family might be able to provide. And on the teaching the skills, I think what schools like us are doing are teaching explicitly skills that are typically taught at home, how to take turns, how to be polite, how not to punch somebody when you get frustrated. And schools can't get to the academics until they do that because kids are not attending to their learning. And then the other thing I would just say to underscore your point about is it expensive? It is expensive, but the ROI is, I think, what you're referring to. And one data point is uh, it costs 245000 to incarcerate a youth every year in DC. So this is far less expensive. And these are children who are typically on that periphery of the school to prison pipeline. So the prevention of that is actually a large short-term savings, not to mention the ROI down the line of incarceration, mental health, et cetera. So I am interested, are more states thinking about that, especially with the growing um, numbers of kids re-entering, or those preventive services were for kids who were previously removed, but they're still in families that are really facing a lot of challenges and the, so, the more I, is that, are you seeing that happen? While, while you have I, the mic, oh, how, many, yeah. how many kids in your school? Uh, 130. And what's the age range? Ours is fifth through eighth grade. So middle school is actually when a lot of our students would typically start dropping out of school uh -huh. um, and often don't show up in high school. Um, many do, but a number don't. Yeah. And if you don't mind, what's the unit cost, the per child per year approximate budget? Um, so for us, it's around, uh, and we're boarding, uh -huh. um, and uh, so just it's important to know over 50% of our kids have IEPs, and most of those are uh, special education yeah, plans and right. full-time. So we're roughly 60000 but 20% uh, of our budget goes just to pay for our facilities. Hmm. So if we didn't. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to, to answer the question quickly, I don't see a lot of growing interest in the school models, and I think one reason for that is that these are two very separate bureaucracies, the school bureaucracy and the child welfare bureaucracy. Um, uh, there is very little communication. And so even the schools that are really trying to you know, uh, help kids and figure out what they can do to improve the situation at home, uh, they often don't get information that they need out of the child welfare bureaucracy. And the child welfare bureaucracy doesn't you know, turn around and say, hey, school, could you, you know, help us with this, that, or the other thing. Instead, they're providing counseling or other services outside of the school that have to be arranged in other ways. So I think it would be great if states started thinking of these two institutions as working in concert for these kids. But right now, there's a, just a big separation. A, a parallel point that needs to be made, because it, it comes up every time anyone makes the sort of ROI argument, which is an absolutely legitimate argument, but we have to keep in mind that the people that, that vote on budgets and appropriations for the prisons are not the same people that vote on budgets and appropriations for the schools. Uh, and so the ROI calculation can be made in think tanks, but it never actually faces uh, the people who are creating budgets and appropriations yep. in any level of government that I'm aware of. Uh, how that can be made clearer uh, to those who do budgeting and stuff like that, I have no idea. But that's a worthy project for, uh, um, for, the, for the next project. Um, okay. Uh, well, first of all, join me in thanking Naomi for a terrific presentation.
Thank you. And we are going to take about a three-minute stretch break. There's uh, water and coffee and a few more sandwiches. And then we are going into the second round of our doubleheader. Good afternoon. I am Mike Petrilli. I'm the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and a visiting fellow here at the Hoover Institution. And I'm excited that I get to moderate the second game in our doubleheader, uh, our conversation with Jonah Goldberg about civics education. Uh, you know, for those of you who are not from Ed Reform World, uh, Ed Reform World, just like Education World, uh, we are very susceptible to fads. Uh, this will not come as a great surprise to you. Uh, it was not so long ago that we were all obsessed with college. College, college, college. That was what we were about, was getting more kids, maybe all kids, uh, to and through college. Then a few years ago, we started thinking, you know, maybe that doesn't make complete sense uh, that everybody needs to go to college. You know, maybe careers actually are important as well. Maybe career and technical education, if it's high quality, not such a bad thing. So, so then we started talking about college and career. But those two C's, of course, leave out another C, uh, which is citizenship. Uh, famously, way back when, when America's uh, public education system was being built, that was one of the major arguments, was that we needed uh, schools in order to build citizens, particularly important in a democracy. Uh, and it is only recently, you could argue since uh, Many uh, education reformers woke up in November 2016 to the Trump uh, presidency uh, that there's been this renewed interest in civics education. On the left, when you hear these conversations about how uh, civics education is broken, it often comes down to if, if it weren't broken, uh, you know, we wouldn't have voted for Donald Trump. Uh, that obviously is problematic in, in many respects to come at it from that uh, perspective. But I think there are certainly folks from across the ideological spectrum who share this nagging belief that something seems to be wrong in terms of how we are teaching history and civics and preparing the next generation of citizens uh, coming out of our schools. Uh, so Joan is going to dig into all of this today. Uh, and I hope that we can have a, a robust conversation about, first of all, what is the problem that, that we think we are trying to address here uh, and how might we go about about this uh, better going forward. Uh, Jonah barely needs an introduction in this room, but I will give it to him anyways. Uh, briefly, Jonah Goldberg is a fellow in Asnes Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he is also a senior editor at National Review, and he is a best-selling author and columnist. Uh, his newest book is Suicide of the West. I highly recommend it. I read it, Jonah, together with Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. And it's, I have to say, it's, it's, it, it's really fun to read those two books together and to have folks on the right and the left both making this argument uh, that over the past 300 years, uh, we have made incredible, incredible progress uh, in, in virtually all respects, uh, and yet uh, we have a moment right now when so many people throughout the West, certainly here in America, feel like everything is going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, and why is it that we have this disconnect at a time that where there is so much prosperity and so much to be gra grateful for? Uh, you know, we feel like the politics are moving in such a different direction. So I highly recommend that. And, and in that book, he gets into some of these issues around uh, how we teach our young people about our founding and about uh, the gifts that our founders uh, gave to us. So with that, let's hear from Jonah Goldberg. Take it away. One of my standard rules about speeches um, is uh, never talk to an audience that knows more about a subject than you do, um, at least not about the subject that they all know about. Um, I once gave a talk to a group of uh, con uh, the trade association for large earth moving equipment manufacturers. <laughs> and uh, the first question out of the box was whether or not the next Congress was going to carry over the depreciation of the uh, Title VI, you know, Queen Estray, Framfra of the what? I had no idea what he was talking about. And so, um, one of my decisions here is to sort of Kobayashi Maru this a little bit and um, uh, and talk about the stuff that I actually know about rather than get into the weeds on the stuff that you all know about. Um, I clearly um, do not know. There are plenty of people who here who know a lot more about education than I do. And I want to thank all of you guys for sticking around for the second half of this. I know there's more of a constituency for school choice issues and whatnot in Washington than there is in civics, which I think is telling. And I also, I mean, fake news will never reveal how big this crowd is, which I really appreciate. So um, 
Uh, so I'm going to do this a little more informally, but um, and as Henry VIII said to each of his wives, I won't keep you long. Um, but let's um, let's survey uh, just a, a few data points here. Uh, more than a third of Americans surveyed by the Annenberg Center for Public Policy in, in September of 2017 uh, failed to name a single freedom enumerated in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Only 26% of respondents could name all three branches of government. Um, that was down from 38% in 2011. 33% could not name a single branch of government. Only one respondent out of more than 1,000 surveyed by the Freedom Forum could name all five freedoms protected by the First Amendment. But 9% said they believed it protected the right to bear arms. Um, according to a survey by the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, just over a third, 36% of Americans can pass a multiple choice test consisting of items taken from the US citizenship test. A passing score is uh, 60%. More than two-thirds were unable to identify the 13 colonies that ratified the Constitution. Less than a quarter could answer the question why we fought the British. Sorry, James. Um, only a quarter, 24%, could name a single thing Benjamin Franklin was famous for. And um, a third believed he, believed he invented the light bulb. Um, interestingly, 65, people 65 and older had a much higher pass rate on these sorts of things than young people did. 74% of people over the age of 65 passed, while um, only 19% of people under the age of 45 passed. So the children are getting worse, not better, or the youngins are. Now, that's the only data I've got for you in this whole thing. Uh, and the, where I want to go is somewhere a little different. Um, Michael brought up uh, Steven Pinker's book, um, Enlightenment Now, which I think is a good book and it's a useful book. Um, but I, where I think he gets things wrong is that he basically has this attitude of everything that is good in the last 300 years is about the enlightenment and reason. And everything that is bad is not the enlightenment and is about unreason or badness. And um, he also treats the enlightenment like it was a single thing. There were actually a bunch of different enlightenments. There was a German enlightenment. There was a French enlightenment, which did not go great. Uh, there was an, the English Enlightenment. There was an American Enlightenment. I used to have the standard policy when talking about Enlightenments, uh, borrowed from the movie So I Married an Axe Murderer, that when it comes to Enlightenments, if it's not Scottish, it's crap. Um, but that's probably a little too glib, because there are good parts of some of them. But the reason I bring this up is that there is a tendency when we talk about the Enlightenment, there's a tendency among eggheads and intellectuals and think tankers. You know, ideas defining a free society is a very conservative think tanky um, way of formulating things, is to focus almost entirely on reason and on, on ideas. And the truth is, is that for most of human history, the way we understood things was through stories. The human brain is wired to understand things through stories. Uh, we didn't have written language until fairly recently in the evolutionary record. And until then, almost all knowledge was passed along through one story of one sort or another. The Bible is many things, but at its most basic level, it's a collection of stories. Every significant moral event in your life, every life lesson you've ever had, has a story attached to it. That's how we understand things. That's how we communicate things. And the, my thesis is, is that the way to understand civics is not to talk about it as if it is a product of this sort of enlightenment mechan mechanistic understanding about the way we arrange institutions, or whether you want to call it, you know, sort of the watchmaker approach, or, or any of these kinds of things. It's it's a story. It's simply the story we tell about who we are as a country, why we are the way we are as a country. A civilization is really nothing more than the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. It's a narrative. And when you don't tell the story the right way, or when you don't tell the story at all, or when you rewrite the story, you get consequences from that. And so um, part of my obsession these days is um, focusing on how we're messing up the storytelling. And um, you know, 
part of the argument I make in the, the chapter that I'm working on for these guys is uh, I begin with recounting the story of Goldfinger, um, a classic James Bond film, for those of you old enough to remember it um, or have watched it in reruns a thousand times. Um, now, first thing I should note before we get into the actual details of it, uh, I, re -re I recently rewatched the movie Goldfinger, and I was stunned how... I'll be blunt, how rapey James Bond was in it. So we'll just put that aside. Um, but for those of you who don't remember the movie Goldfinger, the villain of Goldfinger is, uh, um, is a guy who does not want to rob Fort Knox. Spoiler alert, the whole movie is set up as if he's going to rob Fort Knox, and it turns out that's not his plan. What he wants to do is set off a dirty bomb inside of Fort Knox and irradiate all of the gold inside of Fort Knox thereby making it impossible to bring to market, making therefore gold economically more scarce and his already huge stockpile infinitely more valuable. And to me, this is sort of metaphorically or narratively uh, very similar to what the Howard Zins of the world want to do. If you read Howard Zinn's People's History of America, he basically openly and, and unabashedly says that um, the story he is going to tell is from the perspective of the victims. Slaves, the Irish slums, the coal miners, the Trail of Tears, all of these sorts of things. That is, and these are the only stories that matter, according to Zinn and his history of America. And that, is ba that mindset, to one extent or another, that way of telling the story of America has taken over vast swaths of... Um, intellectual life, and when I say intellectual life, I don't just mean in terms of college educators or even education um, writ large, but also Hollywood, um, uh, popular fiction, journalism, all of these things are infected with this idea that the only important stories to tell about America are the, about the stories that reflect poorly on the idea of America or that highlight white supremacy and all of these kinds of things. And I should point out, since it's sort of relevant to um, uh, our first talk this afternoon, um, uh, this is very common in high-end elite high schools and grade schools uh, on the East Coast. You know, and th I always try to tell people, you know, look, uh, school choice is great for a lot of things, and it may not solve people uh, who are in special needs at the at the bottom of the socioeconomic or um, cultural ladder. Um, it also doesn't solve these issues. I have school choice. I spend, I'll tell you, about forty thousand a year, forty thousand dollars a year to send one kid to high school. And any elite school in Washington, in the Washington D.C. area, would largely subscribe to these kinds of ideas about America. There is no elite school I'm aware of. Some are better than others, but none have remotely a as far as I am aware, a, a truly sort of patriotic understanding of American history. Um, and uh, and there, there's a reason why for it. I am kind of obsessed these days with Joseph Schumpeter. And for those of you who don't know, he was an Austrian economist, although he never gets labeled with the Austrian economist. And uh, in his book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, he prophesied the end of the capitalism's doom. And his argument, he sort of turned Marx on his head. He said it wasn't going to be the proletariat that was going to rip up the paving stones and um, tear down the bourgeoisie and the ruling classes. It was actually going to be the children of the ruling classes. That um, there is something in a, in a sort of Hegelian dialectic embedded in how capitalism evolves over time, where uh, you start out with incredibly impressive robber baron types, men of action, right? Schumpeter gets a lot of this from Nietzsche in the genealogy of, gene, genealogy of morals, which we don't have to get too deep into. Um, but you start with men of action, very poorly educated, if educated at all. I think it was Vanderbilt who said his entire life he read only one book, and he read it when he was 70 years old. Um, and so you get these sort of the robber baron types who make incredible fortunes, captains of industry. They build up essentially secular dynasties of wealth. And then they have kids. And what they do is they overeducate their kids and they turn them into lawyers. And then in the third generation, they become, I don't know, you know, poets. 
I think Warren Buffett's grandson is a spoken word poet or something. Um, and part of the reason for it is, is that uh, as you get more wealthy, you rely on education not to make sure your kids get rich, but as a hedge against them getting poor. And so you have, um, you know, this, this is the story of my people. The Jews do not make their kids become doctors and lawyers because they want them to be rich. They want to make sure that they won't be poor. And so what happens is you start having this dynamic, not just among the super, cap, super captains of industry, but you have it among sort of the, the mass affluent classes in this country where they over-educate their kids. And Schumpeter predicted this in, I think, 46, even before the G, or 44, even before the GI Bill comes along. And he said what was going to happen is you were going to create a mass class of intellectuals, what's commonly called the new class, of intellectuals who will, like Nietzsche's priests, try to, through the process of what he called resentment, um, which is just the French way of saying resentment, um, they will try to undermine the existing society. That intellectuals will be the storytellers of our civilization, and they will tell a different story of our civilization, undermining our civilization. And we have seen this, I think, unfold almost uh, uh, inexorably over the last 50, 75 years. We now have a mass class of new, of, of new class types. Uh, Joseph, uh, James Burnham called them the managerial class of people who are in the industries that are involved in shaping ideas, manipulating images, telling stories, and they are telling this, essentially, to one extent or another, this Zinian story of America, this story where we hold up the worst aspects of our story and say this reflects the whole thing. And, uh, and so what I would like to do is just offer very briefly an alternative way about talking about civics. Yeah, by all means, you got to talk about three branches of government and all these kinds of things and what the Federalist Papers are and what the First Amendment does, that's all great. But at the most fundamental level, um, you need to tell the story of America as um, a story that includes all of the terrible stuff. All the stuff that Zinn talks about, I want to be taught. But you need to put it in the right context. If you don't teach the bad stuff, you cannot tell the story of overcoming the bad stuff. Um, it absolutely must be said that slavery was a profound moral evil. And you can't have a conversation until you concede that. You should also put in the context that what was interesting about slavery in the United States and a grand historical sweep of things wasn't that we had it, but that we got rid of it. Because slavery has been a human institution, not throughout humanity's existence, but at least since the agricultural revolution. And, um, uh, and so the second point is, is it's, once you say, admit that it's an evil, the more interesting point is that it was profoundly hypocritical. The founding fathers were, were, were deep-seated hypocrites as a group, not every individual one, because they wrote this document that said all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And then they didn't grant these rights to women. They didn't grant them to a lot of people who didn't own property. They certainly didn't grant them to slaves. It's grotesque moral hypocrisy going on there. But the irony is, is that there's a great thing about hypocrisy. You can only be a hypocrite if you have principles. If you have no principles, you have nothing to fall short of. Right? Uh, you, know, you know, if Hannibal Lecter didn't think it was good to eat people, he would be a hypocrite if he ate people, but he did, so he could live down to his principles. In a society where, that has begun with this idea that says that we are all endowed by our creator, this was, in a sense, this time bomb in the story of America. And it's interesting, you know, when the Declaration was written, the interesting and exciting part around the world was not the stuff at the beginning, that was basically Jefferson on a writer's deadline, right? Um, the interesting stuff was the end. Independence, independence from England. That was the news. The beginning was filler. And then what you get at the Gettysburg Address is you get Abraham Lincoln coming forward and basically not so much rewriting 
but crystallizing the, the actual through line, which is this idea that we, you know, our four score and seven years ago, our forefathers came forth on this nation to give birth to a new idea that we are all endowed with, with, with continent and liberty, and what, I can't quote the Gettysburg Address off the top of my head, which I probably should at some point, and uh, more civics education. Um, but and he, in effect, made the beginning of the Declaration the important part. A hundred years later, you get Martin Luther King, almost literally exactly a hundred years later, coming to uh, the March on Washington, not far from here. And, and what he does is he appeals to white America, a phrase I cannot stand. Um, um, but he appeals to white Americans and says, you are falling short of the story you tell yourselves about yourselves. You are falling short of your best selves. And he says, you know, that the art, he says, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. Um, and it, this idea that, as he put it, we are all endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, including black men, was a way of, of pinging the sense of historical and hypocritical guilt of white America and telling people to live up to your best standards if you want to be consistent. The problem that we have now is that we no longer talk about these ideal, look, we've had debates on college campuses and, and everywhere else about how to, where to draw the lines on, on various policies and principles forever, right? Take free speech on college campuses. The debates over where to draw the lines of free speech have been around forever. The problem that we have today is that the very idea of free speech is now considered illegitimate. The idea of free speech is seen as a tool of oppression, a tool of the patriarchy or white supremacy. Um, identity politics now is taken as um, is something that we teach from a very young age. We are taking the unum out of e pluribus and, and only talking about the pluribus. And we tell people that their, their identity and their meaning is caught up in the color of their skin. And so now the argument that we are taught, the story that we tell, is that um, uh, Martin Luther King's appeal to judging people by the content of the character rather than the color of their skin is either it's taken out of context and you don't really understand what he was saying, or that the very principle of colorblindness is somehow suspect or somehow illegitimate. And so we are turning the idea, we are making the very ideals that we never fully lived up to, but we've been getting closer and improving towards throughout the history of this country, where instead of saying, hey, we've still got a way to go, we are now teaching kids that those very ideals are no longer things that should be considered ideals. And that's a suicidal choice, as I would argue. Um, and I mean, it's, it's amazing on Twitter, if you mention the word colorblindness, even to mean like literally colorblindness, like, like can't see red or green or something like that, it takes about five minutes for the waters to get chummed and people to start screaming, you don't understand, colorblindness is a social construct that is demeaning to people of color and blah, 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 blah. It's like the very word colorblindness is now considered illegitimate. And so what I would like to see in terms of civics in this country is just figuring out a way to tell this story of America, the story of improvement, the story of getting better, the story of um, pointing out that, that what makes this country special isn't our sins, it's our ability to improve ourselves. And that is something that allows us to you open yourself up to everybody. You know, I'm very grateful to Yuval Levin for making this point, or at least he was the first one I, where it sort of penetrated my cranium, about how conservatism should be understood as a form of gratitude. You look around society and you look at the things that you feel are lovely or lovable or worth preserving or passing on to your children, and you say you want to protect these things. And 
If you don't teach gratitude, you teach the opposite. Of, you end up teaching the opposite of gratitude. And the opposite of gratitude is resentment. It's entitlement. And we are, we are raising large cohorts of children, of elite kids, with this profound sense that the world owes them something, with this profound sense that um, we, they can take the world around them completely for granted and want more from it, and that someone else should be giving it to them. And that is a poisonous way to raise kids. I'm very taken with Jonathan Haidt's and, and Greg Lukanov's coddling of the American mind, because I, I've made this argument for years that you know, political correctness has been around for, depending on how you define the term or whatever, since the 1930s, certainly since the 1980s. Um, and it never really took hold the way it has now. And the reason why is because if you are a politically, if you are a sort of left-wing uh, identity politics type academic, these are the kids you've been waiting for. These kids have been raised in a cultural and psychological milieu that makes them open to the ideas of things like trigger warnings, that makes them open to the idea that um, free speech is oppressive if it, makes, if it, it, if it conflicts with your self-esteem. And, and so I agree very much with this notion. I, you know, Donald Trump, he's a symptom of our problems. Um, he's making some of those problems worse. Uh, but our real problems are way upstream of what's going on in Washington. They have to do with how we're raising our kids or how we're not raising our kids. They have to do with the breakdown of the family and the institutions that turn us from the barbarians we're born as into citizens. And the way you start, you know, Hannah Arendt had that great line where she says, every generation of Western civilization is being invaded by barbarians. We call them children. And you start, you start civilizing the barbarians that are born into your, the civilization of your family. You don't do it with abstract principles of reason. You don't talk about the enlightenment. You model behavior and you tell them stories. And we've given up on the process of telling people the kinds of stories that can fill them with a certain sense of gratitude for the world and the country that they're born into, but at the same time understand that there's more work yet to be done. Anyway, thank you all very much. Uh, powerful. Oh, I don't know about that, but thank you. All right. We'll get you the best. Now we'll get to the grilling. Yeah. Uh, so I'll start with some grilling, Jonah. So I, I find it all very compelling. And, you know, but then again, I also live here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I see the kind of uh, what, what you've described in terms of uh, how we raise children inside this bubble. But I wondered, is this a bubble? I mean, if you had to imagine and you thought about how kids in the heartland are being taught American history, uh, from grade school up through high school. I mean, do you think that there's the same problem out there, that they are being taught the Howard Zinn version of history and not something that's more balanced? Is this just something that you're sensitive to because of where you live and, and you know? Yeah, I have, a, I have a couple answers to that. One is um, I do think it's better out in, quote, unquote, flyover country, right? I've, I was talking to my friend David French, who lives in a fairly rural county in Tennessee, and he says, you know, his kids go to a high school, like just a high school, like a, a normal American high school. You know, it's got it's a cross section of mm -hmm. rich and poor, races and all the rest, and, and they have very little of the PC stuff. Meanwhile, I have a friend who's a big Hollywood guy, showrunner in, in Hollywood, and he was telling me about how at his kids' school, they um, are pushing very hard the gender um, stuff, and they ask nine and 10 year olds. Like, they ask 9 and 10-year-old boys, do you like girls? And if they give the answer, which in my, you know, my day was the correct answer, which was, I don't know, um, they say, okay, so you're questioning. And um, so there is the disconnect kind of stuff. I would say part of the answer is, okay, that's a perfectly fine point. But at the same time, I actually worry a lot about how we raise elites. And I, you know, I've probably been on 100 college campuses in the last um, 15 years. And among, at elite schools, with all sorts of caveats and exceptions, uh, these are the kids who are going to go on to run our institutions. Mm -hmm. These are the kids who are going to go on to be politicians and HR directors and teachers and academics. And first of all, they come out of college having imbibed a whole bunch of attitudes that they then pass along. I think you judge utopian movements by what uh, 
um, by what they, um, by the, so the values they accept. And I actually think that there's a certain kind of end of history attitude that you get at elite college campuses where you want to live in a world where everything is provided for you. And the worst thing you can do is hurt someone's self-esteem. And at the same time, you think you're independent. Right? I mean, I always tell these college kids, let me get this straight. Um, your food is paid for, your clothing is paid for, your rent is paid for, uh, your security is provided for, people cook for you, people clean for you, and you think you're independent? Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and so I think that mindset does a lot of damage. And we are increasingly living in a society where having a good work ethic and a strong back isn't enough anymore. And... I, going on a sh sort of Schumpeterian analysis, one of the things I think that is messing up the country is that people don't understand how complexity is a subsidy. And the elite kids get out of schools, they're in these pipelines, and willing, uh, consciously or unconsciously, they are designing a society that is very easy to navigate for people with high levels of cognitive or social capital or financial capital, um, but very difficult to penetrate if not. And uh, if you've got a lot of lawyers or if you've got a lot of contacts, it doesn't matter what new regulations come down the pike, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And the kids who come out of these schools where they're not all Zinian, um, uh, they don't learn the shibboleths, right? I mean, I'm convinced that's a big reason why these Asian kids are being discriminated about at Harvard. It's not because they don't like Asians. It's because they don't like kids who aren't necessarily interested in being, you know, women's studies majors focusing on antebellum lesbian mores. And they want, and they don't want engineers. They want woke Asians. And uh, I think those those sort of invisible status manipulations mm -hmm. and sort of de facto aristocracies are a real problem. But let's get back to K twelve and the sure. system. Fifty million kids out there. I mean, it seems likely, doesn't it, that right now what probably is happening is that you have in blue America the more Howard Zinn version of history being taught, and in Red America, something that's more patriotic. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Um, on one level, look, I'm a huge fan of federalism, so that's okay. Uh, but it's not in a vacuum. The, um, the, polariza you know, the polarization that we're seeing today um, is across a broad... It, it, it's, a, it's a social phenomenon, right? You now have partisan affiliation mapping populations almost the way religion or ethnicity did 100 years ago. Right. Um, and the way these different school systems teach these things reinforces a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so you get this attitude from the kids who come out of the blue state schools yep. um, with a deep abiding contempt and almost tribal hatred for the kids who come out of the red state schools. And the institutions, maybe not of high, not maybe not of K through 12, but certainly these ancillary institutions of cultural formation, of talk radio, and all the rest, mm -hmm. they are, you know, one of the things that breaks my heart about this moment we are in is how many people on the right are abandoning the sort of classical liberal understanding of 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 America, which is that you're supposed to take people as you find them, and instead they're coming up with their own right wing version of identity politics. Mm -hmm. And that is in large part a response to the left-wing identity politics that has been pushed down them from a great height, but also through schools and elsewhere. Yep. Now, some of our friends in the libertarian movement would look at all of this and say, look, it's, it's impossible. If, if you're a school and you try to teach the story as you say, you know, we're going to say warts and all, but the good stuff, the overcoming it, but also the bad stuff, you know, you're never going to please everybody. You're going to get angry parents, and this is why we just we need school choice. We need to allow there to be different kinds of schools that approach this issue differently, and rather than trying to come to some kind of agreement around these uh, hot-button cultural issues, we just let there be pluralism and diversity. Uh, does that make sense to you? Uh, partly. I mean, look, I'm, I'm very much in favor of school choice or various competitive models, yeah. you know, whether it's public school choice or, it's, or charter schools. I, you know, I, I don't follow all that that closely, but I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of more competition as much as possible. Um, I'm more in favor by just simply localism, mm -hmm. of pushing as much power and responsibility down to the most local level possible. Um, but again, there is this cultural sorting problem. 
the people who want to, you know, Irving Kristol used to make this point all the time. People would say, um, you know, well, shouldn't we have our own alternative conservative culture and our own conservative mm -hmm. newspapers and magazines and TV networks and movie studios and all the rest? And Irving, who was a very close student of Schumpeter, uh, said, where are you going to get the people to run these things? Because the problem is, is that the people who are the sort of new class types, the people who are interested in, in manipulating ideas and images and telling stories, are disproportionately interested in going into fields like journalism and education. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a basic conservative outlook, you're more likely just, and this, is, this is not a good or bad. There are lots of wonderful left-wing teachers and there are lots of wonderful you know, right-wing businessmen, but just the sociology of it is just mm -hmm. very different. And, um, and so, but what I would like to just, I, I think, again, I think most of our problems are, upst are upstream of Washington. If you could send as much power down to the most local level possible, um, you might actually have people live up to their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you also would have, you still have things like culture wars, but at least the winners would have to look the losers in the eye in the next day, which mm -hmm. breeds a certain humility and understanding about who your opponents are. Um, but so, by all means, I'm not a big fan of you know public sector unions, particularly teachers unions. I'm all in favor of sort of breaking up these kinds of monopolies. You're still going to need some kinds of oversight. Um, but the people who want to go into these professions are just as a sociological fact mm -hmm. more interested in telling these kinds of stories mm -hmm. um, about what America is and who it is. I mean, again, I have school yeah. choice. Yeah. Yeah. All the private schools in D.C. are, to one extent or another, like this as far as I can tell. And, you know, again, as an education policy wonk, I think, okay, how do we change this? How do we get the history teachers out there across America to listen to uh -huh. your perspective and, and others like, and to, to think about teaching the story of America this way? There's an impulse in ed reform to say, well, we'll make them do it. You right. know? We'll make sure the history standards are, uh, have, are lined up this way. And we'll have some kind of regime where they'll get in trouble if they don't teach it this way. Or we'll have a history test. And right. you know, the only way that the kids do well is if it's taught this way. But it feels like what's more needed is some kind of persuasion. Right? Yeah. Some, uh, somehow try to persuade uh, the teachers and the, you know, the system that they work in that just teaching the Howard Zinn style history is bad for America. Right. And, and that's one of the things I, I actually appreciate about the Trump moment is that uh, there are lots of, lots of places where I could be scoring points on in the sort of your tears are delicious, you're hypocrites for saying this, that, or the other thing. I'd rather have buy-in. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of decent, serious-minded, progressive types who are like, you know, something's gone awry here. And some of them are losing their minds and over-exaggerating the problem. Trump isn't Hitler. Hitler could have repealed Obamacare. But... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but I think there is this, rec you know, Yasha Monk is one of these guys who recognizes that, uh, um, and Sherry Berman wrote a wonderful piece about this in uh, The Guardian of all places a couple months ago, that when you start talking about white people as A, a monolith, mm -hmm. and B, as inherently, uh, for want of a more nuanced word, evil or bad, um, you don't get white people to agree with you. What you end up getting is them getting defensive and saying, hey, wait a second, you know, I never had slaves or my, you know, my grandfather, you know, fought in World War II or, you know, I'm from Vermont where my great grand or great great grandfather fought for the Union Army. Why am I, you know, being beaten up like this? And you get people to be defensive and then you start getting people to start to develop a white identity, which is historically fairly anonymous in America. I mean, there used to be a WASP identity, mm -hmm. but Italians and mm -hmm. East Europeans were not considered whites, and Jews certainly weren't. And that, none of that is good for America. And I think there are more and more people who are recognizing that. And so it's interesting. I didn't mention it, but I saw this on Twitter this morning. Apparently, Barack Obama was on C-SPAN recently, and he said, where is this thing? Well, I thought I had it in there. Um, he had this thing where he said, look, people need to realize when they talk about identity politics that the people who originated identity politics were the ones who said that blacks counted for three-fifths of white people. Jim Crow is identity politics. Now, he's wrong about the three-fifths clause. 
um, in terms of the historical context, and it didn't originate there. Identity politics goes back 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. But it's actually very, very helpful to have Barack Obama pointing out mm -hmm. that white supremacy is a form of identity politics, and that judging people in, you know, saying, you know, identity politics is basically this idea that is as old as aristocracy, that says that simply by virtue of an accident of your birth, mm -hmm. some people are better or more deserving than other people. And uh, it's amazing how people can recognize the problem with that when they're on the outside of the group, but they don't recognize it within their own group. Mm -hmm. And the, the emphasis on these things like identity politics, you know, telling like five-year-old white kids that you know, they're beneficiaries of white supremacy, um, which they may be to some extent, but it, it's not a great mindset to have mm -hmm. of thinking that the second you walk into the room, if you see someone, once you know the color of their skin, you know all you need to know about them. That is not an American idea. That is the kind of, those are the kinds of ideas that America was founded to reject. And, um, and I, I think that persuasion on this is the only way to go. All right, let's open it up to some questions. So we're going to grab the microphone. Uh, it's me again, Sheikh Itiri Saiz. Uh, so uh, in 2000, Bob Kagan wrote of Colin Powell that uh, he can, uh, he thinks that to go to war, the whole public should support the war. The problem is that he doesn't think the public will ever support a war. And the problem with a lot of conservatives today is that uh, they think that we should not spend, uh, waste, spend, uh, waste spend money. The problem is that they think everything government spends is a waste. Mm -hmm. And you were recently at Arizona State, my alma mater, at School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. It's a great school. It's uh, the board of it are a lot of Hoover people. And it's a civic education school. So I was wondering two questions. One, uh, is that actually a worthy public spending? And two, uh, states that are not willing to do that, should the federal government get involved or not? All right. So for those of you who don't know, um, the school is talking about the Arizona State Legislature, which I did not know really much of any of this stuff until I got out there. The Arizona State Legislature just basically said, screw this. We're not teaching our kids really important stuff like civics, classics, the canon, free market economics. So they created these schools at Arizona State and um, University of Arizona um, that do it. And I was... I, when I was first getting briefed on this, I was like, oh, this sounds kind of sketchy. But the academics there are all top flight as far as I could tell. You know, they're, it's, 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 a, it's a weird mix of Straussians and Hayekians, so you, know, you never know what you're going to get. But um, uh, the problem with it they have on a funding basis is that it's basically a line item in the state budget, and it could go away tomorrow with the political tides. So I was telling them, you really need an endowment. Um, I don't, th I, I, so I think it's great. I was really, really impressed with it. And it was one of those, I'm constantly being asked for like uplifting positive stories because I, you know, I wrote this book that you know, might as well be take a bath with a toaster, right? And, um, uh, and that was really a positive thing. I was really impressed by all of that. And, um, and it seemed to have pretty good support from the school. I don't love the idea of the federal government doing it. Um, I think that, you know, there's a real, first of all, a real danger of O'Sullivan's Law kicking in. O'Sullivan's Law, for those who don't know, is my colleague at National Review, John O'Sullivan, said any institution that is not explicitly conservative becomes liberal over time. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because of this Schumpeterian stuff, mm -hmm. right, is that the people who are interested in doing foundation work go into foundation work, and they tend to be from, you know, one world. And... Um, but I would be, you know, if you could come up with some sort of National Endowment for Humanities kind of block grant kind of thing to do more of that stuff, I'd be interested in it. But I'm so in the mood of, in the mode of pushing power down to the most local level possible. The idea of a new federal program for anything kind of makes me want to flip the safety on my rifle. My name is Scott Spages. Um, thanks for being here. Growing up, I had a real interest in social studies. And the people around me who loved me said, um, don't waste your time. There's no money in that. So, of course, I went to college, I got, studied architecture, and eventually got a degree in business because I had no proclivity in architecture. So do you think that's an important component in this moving forward to, to help people to see a career path in these types of subjects uh, to revive this? I do. I, 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 you know, I, I, 
there's a chicken or the egg problem with like let's just double teachers' salaries. Um, that kind of thing keeps the existing teachers in there. I, I'm a, I'm a very and I, and I want to be very clear. You know, I've been around the country talking about a lot of this kind of stuff, and I meet some really wonderful, including public school teachers all around the country who are interested in civics. This is not a completely broad brush thing. There are all there are myriad exceptions to the rule, but we're talking about it at the level of generalization. Um, I think it's a problem. I think you know part of the problem, part of it is a symptom of uh, the sort of romantic era we're in of individualism and this idea of sort of sacrificing of yourself for the greater good um, actually appeal, ironically appeals more to people in search of a sort of a religious mindset. You know, there's a, there's a certain extent to which contemporary progressivism and liberalism is essentially a secular religion. Um, and, uh, and it attracts people who are, who are decent, good people who are looking to satisfy that itch. And um, the more traditionally religious, particularly of all the, sort of the sort of Protestant you know, uh, work ethic type, they have opportunities to do good in their own community through their churches and local civic institutions. And so they want to build up a business. They want to build up a career and all of the rest. And they want to provide for their families. It's a different psychological outlook. I don't know how you fix that per se. I do think, though, that if you, if more, I, I, in my dream of dreams, I would like to invert the tax pyramid in this country. I would like most of your tax dollars to stay close to home. And then the stuff that goes to Washington is only for the stuff that's actually like in the Constitution, uh, you know, military. Mentions the post office, you know, but that's about it, right? And um, uh, again, that's not actually doable, but I think that's a way to think about it. And, and if you did that, the opportunities for recognition and status in local communities would be more available, and they would matter more. Instead, we have this big sorting where if you really want to make a mark in life, you feel like you have to leave your various communities and go to a handful of cities, sort of like Amazon. And um, and I think that is a driver of a lot of our problems. But I, I do, there's something here, though, about how we talk about our teachers. And I don't remember anybody back in the Obama days, certainly not with Betsy DeVos or other people with Natch, kind of a platform, talking about teachers as potentially a big part of the solution to the mm -hmm. partisanship and to what's bringing this country apart, that they can help bring us together, you know, teaching our children how to have respect for people who have different views, but also to, you know, teaching. Them. I think that would be very compelling if we found yeah. a way to value teachers. I mean, of course, we've got to worry about the nuts and bolts of it as well, but that, that would resonate with a lot of people. And I think, I think you're right that there are a lot of teachers out there do go into it, uh, you know, not just, uh, you know, that they like kids, they want to work with kids, but also, you know, this notion that you are our nation builders, you right. know, and, and you have an important role and we value you for that. could be powerful. Raj? Thanks, Mike. Raj Vinicotta. I'm just wondering, Jonah, how do you, um, with localism, address not over-accentuating the pluribus over the unum, especially when it, with the significant geographic sorting that's happening in our country? Yeah. Um, stipulate there will be new challenges. You know, I, as a conservative, I don't believe in uh, silver bullets to anything. I think they're only trade-offs. And so my approach would obviously have problems. You know, Ryan Salam. My colleague in National Review actually has almost not quite the opposite view I have, but he, his view is, is that you want state governments to be really lean, and then the federal government is the only institution that can account for these disparities where, you know, 2% of education spending in West Virginia is just not going to be anything like what 2% of education spending in California is. And, um, and I, I get those kinds of things, but I am... Um, I, again, I'm much more interested in, in part because I'm much more comfortable talking about ideas and stories and arguments than I am about the nitty-gritty of the public policy point. But I will say that the, one, what I think is one of the major problems that we have in this country is that the way we talk about diversity is very much a part of this identity politics thing where we want people to look different but think all the same way. And I, would, I think we could use a lot more conversation about variety. And when I talk to college kids about this, they get it, right? I mean, they've been taught that you can't say states' rights because they immediately think that means I want to bring back slavery because that's what they've been taught. Um, but if you talk about variety, 
we talk about making this a more interesting country to drive across, if you talk about how Austin has a point when they say keep Austin weird, um, or that Oregon shouldn't have to look to a bureaucrat in Washington to be allowed to import stinky cheese or have uh, higher alcohol content beer. Uh, they get that. They, want, they, don't, they don't like the homogenization of America. And um, I think that giving people more power locally, it may cre create economic you know, imbalances and distortions, but you also get, you create more institutions, more ecosystems where people can go to find the lifestyle that suits them. But the and point is, we, we still, there's a problem though, if, you know, in Portland they teach one version of history, yeah. right? And in rural West Virginia they teach another. I mean, there's, right? I mean, this is where we're like, how do we bring some commonality to telling this story, this American story? Yeah, no, I, I get that. But, you know, my hunch is, and Yuval would probably know this better than I would, but my hunch is, is that in the 19th century, the history they taught you in Texas and the history they taught you in New York State and Vermont had some significant disparities already. And I don't think there's any problem with that. You know, the, I, you know, the Founding Fathers used to say, in essentials unity, in everything else liberty. And I think if we did a better job of the civilizational aspect, of well, I can't remember what you call it, but the emotional learning stuff, if we did a better job of civilizing the barbarians, uh, you can fill in the patriotism later. Um, and uh, I think that, that, that a little more civic or if you want to call it nationalistic pride based on a state or local community level would actually be a very healthy thing for giving people a better sense that they first and foremost live in a place that has meaning to them. Well, every state requires some kind of state history, so you yeah. got that. All right. Yeah, Christina? So, yeah, Christina Culver, and uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to grow and scale great schooling. And I'm also on the board of Washington Latin here in, in D.C., which is, has a classical education. And as part of that, I've been kind of mystified at how all of a sudden this is something special that we're teaching uh -huh. versus something that's real. And I, I guess one of my questions is, is, and I've been having conversations with the founder of Great Hearts and Basis and these schools that are trying to grow this pro these programs of classical uh, education and great books is whether or not civics education has kind of lost its brand mm -hmm. and whether or not there's a, another way to talk about it because we can't find teachers to even teach in our schools that have a familiarity with how to teach Socratic method, let alone the content. Yeah. And then you have... Um, so we, we have this pipeline issue, we have parents who don't know what it is, and, um, but, there's, but once they get a taste of it, they want more of it. Yeah. So sort of the, the, the big conversation we're having is how do we build its brand? Yeah. And quite frankly, I would argue that you're really good at it. I just think you need larger audiences. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, don't, I, I don't have a ready-made off-the-shelf answer for that. I will tell you, though, I think there's a real hunger. Again, we're talking about elite family. You know, I, don't, I don't, not necessarily the 1%, but we're talking about upscale affluent families, the kind of families that Charles Murray criticizes for refusing to preach what they practice, um, of staying intact, of raising and educating their kids well, um, but they won't tell other people that bourgeois values be good for them too, right? Um, uh, I was amazed. So my daughter's 15 now. When we look for private schools in D.C., um, every single school we went to, to one extent or another, emphasize, they all emphasized diversity, but all but one that we looked at emphasized diversity as their comparative advantage, which, by which I mean they said, those other schools may talk about how much they care about diversity, but we really care about diversity, right? I care about diversity. It's, it's on my list, like with good gym and, you know, do they teach civic, you know, it's, it's there. I, I don't, I'm not against it, but... This idea that I would pick this school solely based on this, you know, it's like going to a car lot and saying, I want a red car. And, um, uh, and we actually, at Georgetown Day, the headmaster there explicitly told us, um, go read the mission statements of these other schools, and you will find um, 
a lot of code words like academic rigor and scholarship. <laughs> and he said, we want to be very clear with you that we consider our social justice mission more important than our academic mission. And you know, my wife and I were stuck in the middle of this big crowd at an open house, and we were like, you know, do we, how do we get out of here, or should we just start cutting ourselves, right? I mean, it was, and, um, and the, uh, there are a lot of parents out there who have a hunger. They don't want to take the kids to a white supremacist school. They want their kids to have a normal, well-rounded education where this stuff isn't necessarily the focus of everything. And uh, I think that the market is waiting for you out there. Um, it's certainly out there. I mean, I, I have lots of friends who send their kids uh, homeschool, send their kids to parochial and charter schools, hungry for this kind of product. And um, but I don't uh, how you sell it. I, I, you should talk to Tim Carney. He went to St. John's, and he can still take out a cocktail napkin and explain the Pythagorean theorem on it. Um, well. Well, unfortunately, we are at time. Please join me in thanking Jonah for those great comments.